Okay, good morning everyone. Cloudy Saturday morning to you all. We're doing our AI for lunch a little early today because uh, I've got a conversation recording this noontime. And hopefully you guys have been keeping uh, updated on all of my really good conversations uh, for the past week or so. Okay, um, there's quite a lot of information to get by, so I'm just going to kick off. So welcome to episode 9, uh, AI for Lunch. Today we'll be, we will tackle uh, kind of an esoteric topic, uh, AI and social behavior change. Now, it sounds very heavy, uh, but hopefully after today's discussion, you'll find that it's, it's actually similar to uh, what people would call marketing, but this is a term that's more often used in the NGO sector. Okay, so again, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Doc Ligot. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a data analyst by background. I started in financial services, started coding at the age of six, and more recently, I've uh, gone into IT, uh, specifically data, the data industry. So I've been involved in all aspects of the data value chain from data gathering, data engineering, data analysis, database management. And of course, nowadays, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science. And I've been doing these series of talks for going on three months now, uh, almost four months, actually, uh, as a way of spreading broad awareness about artificial intelligence. So since November 2022, uh, there's been a massive increase in the interest in AI, primarily because of generative AI and the launch of chat GPT and similar applications. And at the same time, there's also been an increase in the amount of disinformation and, you know, um, uh, basically bad ideas related to AI. And I wanted to de uh, kind of demystify that. Um, and, you know, I decided to, I've actually wanted to do this as early as January, but, you know, I had to wait a few months to see if anyone else uh, is going to do this. Uh, but then around April, I just decided to do it. So the, the point of all these talks is to spur discussion about the practical adoption of AI in daily life and business. I want to address the alarmist claims about AI and the disinformation about it. And this is these, these talks are usually high level, you know, 18,000 feet view, uh, where I try to share as many references as I can so people know where to look. But at the same time, I also kind of mix my personal views with it. And of course, I welcome feedback on the series and prompts for future sessions. Uh, this is currently live streamed on Facebook, and I also have a, a live Zoom audience. No, I can see Paula here, so welcome, Paula. Um, as a way of you know, just getting more people interested in the topic, uh, topics related to AI, and usually the topics that people don't encounter often, especially on YouTube. I think YouTube and the internet is full of tutorials, you know, how to do machine learning, how to do AI, how to do programming, you know, maybe at some point I might do a thing or two uh, related to that, if I can find something unique. But I thought there's not enough material about how AI can be used. What are the practical applications of it? What are the business applications of it? So I think this, this uh, uh, you know, online series fulfills that niche. Okay, so I'll dive right into the topic. Um, the topic today is social behavior change, or SBC, or social behavior change communications, SBCC. And as I mentioned, this is a topic that's more, uh, more in the vocabulary of the humanitarian sector and uh, NGOs. But even if you're not from the NGO sector, you can, for example, you work in the commercial sector or you're freelancing, you might find some of this information useful because this, uh, what, what the NGOs call SBCC is actually marketing in the commercial sector. I guess the difference is in the humanitarian sector, since it's not for profit, because usually in the commercial sector, the main behavior people want to influence is the buying behavior. You want people to buy your product or service. While in the NGO sector, it's not necessarily about buying stuff. Uh, it's about you know, how do you get people to, you know, uh, change their behaviors and attitudes towards perhaps a, you know, a social issue? Or how, how do you get people to uh, sign a petition? 
sometimes how do you get people to protest you know or donate so those are the kinds of behaviors uh, the humanitarian sector is more interested in how do you get people to to act on a problem in society over and on top of any commercial uh, you know intention okay so before we dive into it obviously the customary intro on AI. Uh, all of the interest, I think majority of the interest now in AI is brought about by generative AI. And to differentiate that with the AI that most people are used to up until recently, uh, a lot of AI applications before November 2022 would be of the discriminative kind, where this is AI that interprets data and gives you some sort of a conclusion or an analysis. So my favorite example is uh, you know, image classification. You give an image of a cat to an AI, discriminative AI, and it will tell you, yep, that's a cat, or it's not a cat, depending on what you uh, gave. The generative AI works sort of in the opposite manner. It also understands data, but with the intention of producing more data. So you give a picture of a cat to a generative AI, it produces variations of that cat. Or you give the word cat to a generative AI, and what it will do is create more cats. You know, So the, the two use cases are complementary. I have begun calling discriminative AI more of perception or kind of the left brain type of analysis, while generative AI is more of creation, creativity, more of right brain. And together, they, they form kind of the traditional view of the human brain, the left and the right. And you work with both together. And in fact, some of the the discussion today on SBCC will actually involve both. You know? So I'm happy to share with you some of the work we've done in the humanitarian sector over the COVID pandemic as examples of what how was done in social behavior change. Uh, so for the remainder of this talk, although with a few exceptions, when I, when I say AI, it will be generative. So everything from uh, deep fakes, uh, image generation, chatbots, uh, which, as we've discussed in other webinars, are mostly around content, content creation, content curation. Uh, and then uh, you can also use generative AI as a way of analyzing data that you get without having to train it or pre-train it beforehand. And I think that's one interesting change in pace compared to previous approaches to AI where you really need to, needed to spend a lot of time and hours, sometimes days, cramming as much information and data into a model, uh, depending on how good your hardware was. Uh, a lot of these generative AI applications already use the pre-built models, uh, which is also kind of its own double-edged blade, because now we're de completely dependent on the public open source models that companies like Meta and uh, OpenAI have made available. And of course, from a commercial standpoint, we, we have to pay them. Uh, especially open AI for access to the higher, the more powerful models. But, you know, that being said, it doesn't mean that we can't get started with generative AI. In fact, many of these models are also available for free. Okay, so uh, let's talk about SBCC. So SBCC is Social Behavior Change Communication. And in a nutshell, as I said, it's it's a way of moving people towards a certain mindset so some of the definitions include communication, changes in knowledge, attitudes, beliefs at multiple levels of society. So how do you get people to act on something? Usually around the social issue, you know, like climate change, gen gender sensitivity, or once upon a time during the pandemic, it was about vaccinations or wearing a mask. The SBCC is not new, you know, I, it's been around for probably for decades. An old term for it was C, C4D, Communication for Development. So it's really got its roots in the development sector. But nowadays, SBCC is employed by pretty much anyone who wants to move people towards a behavior. So it's grounded in a lot of theory. I'll go through some of those theories in a minute uh, because they're really interesting. And when I went, when we went into SBCC, they're highly compatible with data, you know, and AI, as you'll soon see. It also involves on its own a systematic process of problem analysis, looking at barriers and uh, motivators, designing tailored interventions, and of course, uh, messaging. So the core of SBCC is the last C, the communication. So 
anyone who's interested in using comms. Another term I encounter about uh, SBCC strategic comms, strat comms. So if you're a PR agency, a marketing agency, or a marketing professional, a digital marketer, you might find some of the frameworks in SBCC useful. And if you combine that with artificial intelligence, it can be very powerful. I can tell you that SBCC is a core component of what I do in my companies. Like in data ethics, we use SBCC a lot in spreading awareness about kind of the dark side of data and how to get people to protect themselves from all these vulnerabilities. In serialytics, we've used it to great effect in you know working with the humanitarian sector and more recently also working with some nonprofit organizations in you know championing everything from gender to malnutrition. And of course, one of our most famous projects was about dengue. Uh, of course, the technical component I've discussed before, but there's also a behavioral component about dengue. How do you ensure that your environment is clean or it's free from you know stagnant water, which could breed mosquitoes, which could then be a vector in spreading disease? So a lot of SBCC is actually anchored on health uh, interventions as well. Okay, so what the best way, I think one of the best ways to understand SBCC is through this uh, P process, which is a framework uh, coined actually as early as the 80s. Uh, it, it started in health, you know, in John Hopkins uh, University. It's a five-step framework that uh, actually mirrors a lot of the marketing frameworks you see around. Uh, the five steps correspond to you know, what do you need to do to, car to craft a communications campaign? So step one is understanding what the issue is, who do you want to talk to? Step two is designing the intervention. I'll go into some detail about these designs based on communications frameworks. The third uh, set is to develop comms products. I won't talk too much about that because you can find material on, you know, uh, how to craft uh, social media campaigns everywhere on the net. But if you combine step three with step one and two, you can find that you can come up with really compelling communication strategies, advertisements, anything that can move behavior. And then four and five is about monitoring the performance. So I'll have a case study on the monitoring part as well. Okay, so uh, the step, the first step here, uh, you will see very, very close uh, mirrors between this and the theory of change framework, which I shared, I think, a couple of episodes back on social impact. The idea here is it's kind of a, a mini theory of change in its own. First is you want to identify what the current situation that you want to influence is. For example, uh, later I'll show you what we did with vaccinations. We wanted to assess just how bad the vaccine situation was. That's what we want to influence. And then the most crucial part is really understanding who the audience should be. The rule of thumb is you don't want to communicate to everyone. You only need to communicate to a sector of the population that can be the, the kind of the, the, the pivot point for everyone else. Because in any given intervention, there are people who will probably do it already because they understand it. There are people who don't want to do it because reasons. And then there's the movable middle, as they say. The movable middle are people who probably could do it, but they have a few hesitations. And once you've identified who these people are, then you can dissect what their motivations are. They call it barriers, the behavior and facilitating factors. It can be many things. No, It can be their attitudes. It can be their mindset. It can be something physical. It can be something practical. Uh, whatever they may be, these barriers and facilitators are important to identify early in the process. Because once you know who you want to talk to, and what keeps them from behaving the way you want and what would encourage them, then you design your communications around those uh, levers. So this feels very straightforward, but the way you achieve the kind of the situation to objective can vary depending on methods. And this is where I find the communications frameworks quite useful. There are a lot, but I'm just going to talk about the four that we've used, and they're they're also quite heavily referenced in, you know, in behavioral literature. No, uh, I think there's at least twenty frameworks that you can use. So this is the top four in terms of my list. No, uh, they sound very uh, vague, but I'll deep dive into each one. So planned behavior. This is about 
coming up with like cognitive interventions. Parallel processing is about managing fears and hopes. Observational learning is about showing people what other people are doing, and then you create that bandwagon effect. And then the diffusion of innovation is more of a broader framework of how you can do audience uh, segmentation and targeting. No? So first for planned behavior, uh, and I hope you don't mind, I get into a little bit of a lecture here, no? just to give the context of how you might do SBCC. So the goal is to come up with behavioral change. And the main lever there is influencing people's intentions. You know, if you if there's something to be done, people will do it if they intend to do it. That's kind of the, the bottom line. Now, that intention is actually shaped by at least three things, according to this framework. It's shaped by their attitudes towards uh, that behavior. When you say subjective norms, this is what people perceive to be true, whether it's really true or not. And perceived controls. When you say just uh, a control is how people believe their how how people feel empowered enough to do what what needs to be done. Like for example, again, we'll use vaccines as a uh, as a common one. What are people's attitudes towards vaccines? Is it something that they think should be done, or is it something being forced on them? And then subjective norms can change a lot. You know, maybe the norm at the start was no one was getting vaccinated because people uh, didn't trust the vaccines. And then later when the bandwagon effect happened, it's now a norm to get vaccinated. And I think at this point in time, although we are officially out of the pandemic, some people are still getting boosted no? because that's a perceived norm for them. And then the perceived control is, is the vaccine really under your control? Is it something you can influence? Like I remember in the early stages of the vaccination drive, people were reluctant because there was only one brand of vaccine available. But then when multiple brands became available, now people had this sometimes illusion of choice. They say, okay, I'm going to go Moderna. I'm going to go Pfizer. And by that time, you know, the vaccination was already underway. So this is kind of the base framework. Now, the, the secret behind planned behavior is, although these are what people think are norms there's actually kind of a, an intervention that can that you can actually do over and on top of what people believe and that's actually the, the lever you can't really change much in terms of what people's let's say attitudes or subjective norms are and how they perceive their controls are the the best thing you can do here is actually study it and find out what these factors are so that when you make an intervention this is actually the change in the system that you want to uh, address so an, a change can be communication for example you can broadcast a message and attempt to guide people okay this might be your belief but the reality is this so that's one uh, possibility of intervention another is like physical intervention like ma many times people couldn't find places where they could get vaccinated so by just making it more broadly available you could actually change behavior so this is planned behavior this is the first framework Second framework, parallel processing. There's actually a more elaborate diagram, but I, I think it's better to appreciate it as a quadrant. So whenever you think of a behavior or uh, a situation, people will assess it based on two factors. Number one, am I in danger? No? So there's a threat assessment. And second, okay, regardless of whether I'm in danger or not, do I believe that the solution is effective and danger is uh, actually uh, you know relative it doesn't have to be negative danger can be you can flip it around instead of assessing risk you can assess benefits you know? like should I get this product or not do I need that product in my life and then the, uh, the next axis is how much do I believe that this product actually solves my problem you know something like that mm -hmm. So obviously, at the low threat and low efficacy box, people won't do anything. Number one, they don't feel they need it. And second, even if they did, they wouldn't know where to get it. So the strategy here is education. Let's teach them about why you need this thing and where you can get it and why you should get it. You know? So this is often the, the baseline for any behavioral intervention, unless there's already an environment of fear, like in COVID. Now, at the same time, they might actually perceive the threat to be high, you know? Like, I do believe that COVID is a risk, or I do believe that I need this product, but I don't necessarily believe that that's the product I want to get. 
So here it's about managing fears. So people are either too afraid to, to act and they just want to reduce their fear or deny it, uh, but they don't even care about the solution. So the strategy here is you teach them that, okay, granted you have a risk in your life, this is the solution for you. So again, you can see the subtle difference between the two scenarios already. In the first scenario, you actually have to convince them that they have to do something. And this is the something that, that they should do. In the second scenario, they actually believe that they need to do something, but they don't know what to do. And that's why they get scared. And now you need to teach them that, okay, if you believe that you're in danger, this is a solution. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, if they believe in the solution, but they don't believe they need it, so yeah, okay, I agree. You've got a good product or that that vaccine is probably good, but I don't think COVID is a disease or I don't think COVID is an actual actual deadly disease, probably closer to the, the flu, something like that. And that happened a lot. So people don't uh, know what to do, but they're not motivated. So this is a muted response. You'll get some people doing it, but not a lot. So the point here is now you have to educate them why they need to do this intervention or why they need to buy this product. And then finally, the sweet spot is they believe in the product and they believe they need to get it. So this is danger control. They take uh, proactive, protective action to reduce the threat. So it's a call to action. So this actually breaks up the usual marketing paradigm into four scenarios. Because mo most of the time when you hear from marketing, uh, at least from my experience, it's all about just call to action. And it's not about assessing whether the beliefs of the person or the persons uh, actually coincide with the, the benefits you're, you're selling. Most companies actually find themselves here in the muted response category because they may prove that they're worthy or their product is good, but people don't believe they need it. So it's a different type of marketing if you want to you know, induce that need or induce that fear. Sometimes NGOs are... are uh, reluctant to apply this. It's called parallel processing because you have two parallel issues, the efficacy and the threat. Uh, because it's sometimes taboo to engage in fear-mongering. Like uh, nowadays, you hear a lot of fear about AI. So maybe the threat is high, but people don't know what to do. You know, So maybe they're here. They're just uh, cowering in fear. And uh, for me, the, the, the bottom line is get educated about AI so you know what to do. So you know what skills you need to pick up so you don't lose your job or you make your job better. So that's another approach uh, thought uh, about parallel processing. Okay, for uh, observational learning, this is a bit more straightforward because you're, it's, it's the proverbial monkey see, monkey does or monkey see, monkey do. So the first step is attract attention. So the consumer or the user focuses on something that attracts their attention. Next, they need to repeatedly see it so they retain it in their memory. So if you just do one, one thing, it may or may not work depending on how viral it was. But if you keep repeating it and people become used to it, then they retain it in their memory. But you don't drive behavior yet. The third step is they retain something in memory and they now feel that they're empowered to do something. So this is like kind of that part about uh, 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 planned behavior. They need to know that, okay, this is within my control. It's something I can do. And then lastly, show them a situation where they actually need to do it. So one of the best examples of this uh, that we encountered during the pandemic was you can, you can broadcast all of the scientific data in front of someone. It won't move their behavior. The moment you show pictures of people getting sick or pe pictures of people getting vaccinated, more people behave. And that's really the, the social learning aspect of this. You acquire behavior, you see it happening, you know you're empowered, and now you know why you need to do it. It's the most straightforward of all the frameworks, but they're all pretty good. And finally, uh, the diffusion of innovation. This is actually a very classical social behavior framework. Um, it was coined by Rogers, I think, who is a social scientist. The, the whole point here is, and this was also made popular by Simon Sinek in his one of his talks. Um, in any change or innovation, you usually have five groups of people. First are the innovators. They're the ones who actually initiate it. They're the ones who do it first. And then the early adopters are the, the first to follow the innovators. And between these two, it's already around 15 to 16% of the population. 
Now, before you get to early majority and late majority, this is basically mainstream adoption, you have to cross this thing called the chasm. What does the chasm mean? It means that the innovators and the early adopters are normally very alike in thinking. One, the innovators invent something and the early adopters pick it up, understand it, and they're the first to adopt it. But once you get to early majority, the motivations for adopting a product can be very different. And that's why there's a chasm. So you could launch something. And well, what Rogers was saying is you could launch something and easily get to you know 10 to 15% market penetration easily. As long as you're able to broadcast your message, people who agree with your message will come forward. But if you want to get to early majority, you now need to tailor your message to a broader set of people who will have very different uh, innovation uh, intentions about the innovation. And of course, the late majority and the laggards, they'll be last to move because they have other reasons or they don't want to be first. So your goal is to get from zero to 50% by crossing this chasm. Okay, so uh, this is all sounding very abstract. So I, I thought to share with you some actual projects we did where we use this framework to great effect to give you some ideas or inspiration about how these projects work. So first, uh, this was during my time with UNDP. Uh, you can find actually some videos where we talked about this in a UNDP webinar if you go to their UNDP Facebook account. Uh, this, this first project was about how do you influence vaccine acceptance? So the picture is early 2021, the first vaccines were starting to be made available, which is Sinovac and a couple of Modernas, I think. But people were not picking it up. And we were tasked to come in and we, there was data available. So there were Pulse Asia surveys. Of course, we had data from Facebook. We also had data from the University of Maryland. And the idea was, how do you create a strategy that targets people based on their preference in vaccines? So I think I might have shown this diagram a couple of episodes back. So this is the diffusion of innovation that we derived coming from the data we gathered. So there were five, as many as seven, I think, seven uh, groups of people relating to the vaccines. And they, we mapped them across the innovation uh, diffusion of innovation curve. And here are some high-level descriptors about them, you know. The first four are the ones who will likely get vaccinated. Easy cells, early adopters, you know. They're not hesitant. They know they need to get vaccinated. The concern, the supporters, and the pragmatists, these are the early majority. The complacents and the obligated and the skeptics, they're the laggards. No? So one thing you will notice here is from a location perspective, you know, the NCR plus people are usually pro-vaccines. Well, if you go further out in the provinces, there's more hesitancy. And then the reasons for getting vaccinated, uh, I think this is the telling characteristic. So uh, the first four groups, they actually believe COVID is a risk. But then when you go to the latter groups, they either don't think it's a risk or they have other reasons. And then the reasons for avoiding vaccination in the first four groups are usually related to supply because they just can't get it. You know, or it's inconvenient to get it. While in the latter three groups, some of them don't trust the experts. Some of them don't believe COVID is a risk. Some of them are worried about side effects. So you can see how kind of the, the diffusion of innovation curve works in that respect. So the, the intervention we did here was to craft high-level messaging cues based on those three frameworks, the planned behavior, parallel process, and observational learning, and then convert them into uh, cues for a campaign. So for example, the planned behavior, which is more cognitive, we narrowed down on, uh, actually for all of them, we, we narrowed down on the facilitating factors and the barriers to behavior, but phrased the message in such a way that would attack kind of these the, the people in three different ways. For example, if you want to do cognitive messaging, Facilitating factor is to discuss why vaccination is important and or a, a subtle shade on if you don't get vaccinated, what happens to your job? Because many companies were starting to open up during the pandemic and they, you know, they would only allow people to work if they were vaccinated. Then if you look at the barriers to behavior, you want to address the side effects. Most vaccinations actually don't have side effects. It's just the very, very few ones that had side effects that were being hyped. 
uh, at the same time, define efficacy and effectiveness, which is some of the technical terms no, during the campaign. Uh, in the parallel process, it was about establishing COVID as a risk and that the vaccines work. So you establish the threat. What if someone in your household gets sick, everyone gets sick? And then how do you get empower yourselves and take your power back to your family by getting vaccinated so you get your freedom back? And then on the other side of the coin, you also explain that, okay, you can. there's a small risk of side effects, but there's a higher risk of unemployment. So you make a call, you know, you have to deal with your risk assessment. And but the majority of vaccinations actually don't have side effects. So what are you really afraid of if you think of it that way? So you can see there's a parallel approach. One is to prove vaccinations work, but at the same time maintain that, that there's a threat. And then lastly, for social learning, this again, very, very straightforward. Just just show people getting vaccinated or they don't get side effects. Or people with comorbidities, like I have a comorbidity, which is uh, uh, diabe diabetes or pre-diabetes, but are happy to get vaccinated as well. So we provided these cues uh, via UNDP, and they, they shared this with DOH. DOH uh, in, enabled their comms. So this is an example of how communications changed between the time we came in, not first second quarter 2021 and then the latter year so before the intervention a lot of the communication of DOH is very actually very factual very scientific but it doesn't move behavior you don't see any people in it you see lots of words and stats and tables which is good if you're trying to do a research paper on uh, on vaccines but not really good if you want to get vaccinated and then later it became very human you showed uh, you know senior citizens getting vaccinated you you show you know uh, chats etc something more human and that made all the difference. So we were tracking the based on Facebook data and surveys on the ground. The result was quite dramatic within a one year period. We went from very low uptake. When you say uptake, how many people are actually getting vaccinated? So we're on the low double digits to almost the high nineties. You know, and this is within a, a one year period. Of course, it coincided with more supply coming in. And of course, supply was one factor that we wanted to highlight. And then the reported hesitancy was kind of in the mid double digits and now just in the single digits one year later. So very clear that this uh, framework works. Uh, another case I want to share, and I think uh, we still have time, is how do you come in midstream and change uh, behavioral change campaign uh, by you know by me doing some measurements. So the situation here was more around human rights and we were tasked to do measurement on an existing human rights campaign. Uh, usually when you talk about human rights, people are predisposed to political uh, discussions. And the uh, point was, could we move the needle by being more conscious of health and all these other rights? Uh, in, uh, in, in I think the, the platform here was Instagram. So the process in a nutshell was this iterative thing. You know, We would come in and provide uh, information midstream. And then the content creators would then adjust their messaging uh, accordingly. And then we did that for three cycles, you know, March, April, and May. Uh, and then the performance monitoring was, uh, obviously, we, we, we used social listening technologies to pick this up. So these are applications that allow you to harvest uh, data coming from social media, but more around the numbers. Like, okay, like if you can go to Twitter analytics or Facebook analytics, get all of the numbers being posted. Uh, this was done on Instagram, for example. So we just harvested the number of likes before and after the intervention. And the strategy was to A-B test. You know, that's the marketing term. Uh, a particular post, like, okay, the uh, content creator would try this execution and then an alternate execution a period later. And then we would look at like for like comparisons on how this stuff is doing. Actually, many of the platforms today, like Facebook, allow you to do the A-B test dynamically already. We were kind of doing it semi-manually. Like we, we would look at oh, what, uh, what was posted on this date. We extract the numbers. And then after you do the intervention, we do the exact same thing and then compare. We were working with influencers here, you know, photo influencers. Um, 
so the whole point was can you move the needle from discussing just politics about covid you know corruption etc into something more hopeful or into something that looked at uh, stories of resilience and success you know this that kind of thing and uh, by and large the measurement framework actually worked very well because now that the content creators were seeing which posts were doing better than others and which topics were doing better than others then they could tailor their messaging accordingly. So as opposed to the first case where we designed the campaign from the ground up and it worked like clockwork. This one is, it's a campaign that didn't have the benefit of the design, but then if you, in, you know, infuse the measurement approach uh, and looking at dynamically changing the content, it can actually work. So the idea here is um, Everything is data driven already. Everything is digitally, uh, you know, digi executed on digital platforms. So if you are a communicator, whether you're in the commercial sector or in the NGO sector, there is no excuse not to get involved with data and AI because these are the tools that allow you to harvest and analyze the data dynamically. Which brings me to some kind of thought starters. If you want to start implementing SBCC and you want to use generative AI as a as a, as a stepping stone, it's actually much easier now than it ever was. For example, uh, chatbots is an execution uh, method already. You know, Like, uh, I don't know if you know Replica. Of course, I'm not endorsing any provider. Replica is an example of a chatbot as a service. And their base model is just to engage in conversations with you. And then the chatbot learns from that and then starts to give you more personalized and more empathetic uh, conversations. And, uh, you know, early, early results in some research is showing that this can be helpful. Number one is the chatbots are always available while proper counselors are not. They're not meant to replace counselors, just to be clear, but they're more a way of augmenting the reach. It's kind of like telemedicine, but in this case, it's for mental health, or it can be for commercial purposes. Like, how do you train your chatbots from being just rule-based uh, machines into something that's more contextual because of generative AI that can then help diagnose a purchase for a customer. Uh, gamification is an, an excellent opportunity because the gamification and generative AI go together. Uh, I showed uh, an example of a generative AI a couple of episodes back that can generate an online course on the fly. And that can be an excellent uh, way of educating people on social issues like earlier like how do you educate people better on covid once upon a time or nowadays how do you educate people better on fake news how do you educate people better on gender rights how do you educate people better on climate change so whatever the social issue is the gamification plus education method can be quite compelling and because of generative ai it's much easier now to generate the content for these games uh, simulations. I think I don't see too many simulations happening, or maybe they're not public yet. I might do a webinar just on simulations. Idea here is generative AI can create virtual scenarios, and then you can plug that into a simulated environment, like reinforcement learning, for example, and then let the simulation teach you about how people will interact with each other, assuming you have all of the variables set up and you specify simple or complicated rules of how people interact. And then you let the simulation run. Uh, COVID had a few simulation exercises as well. They wanted to illustrate the, uh, you know, the benefits of uh, social distancing and masking. And a simulation was a good way of showing how if you segment parts of the population and they don't move around too much, then you can really bring down the infection and the spread of the disease dramatically. So simulations are a good way for AI to come in and give suggestions. Without being explicit about it, you just monitor the environment and see what happens. Uh, messaging obviously is the uh, one of the low-hanging fruits. Uh, and this is just more than prompting chat GPT for you know, a message here and there. You can actually use uh, context and chain of thought prompting, uh, which I'll probably discuss in another webinar. Uh, to establish a, a series of contexts for the chatbot, and then they can come up with really good uh, messages, the new which you can then tailor fit to whoever audience you want. 
Uh, this is an example that was published by Thinking Machines a couple, I think a couple of weeks back or a couple of months back, where they showed that a zero-shot prompt on a generative AI was able to replicate the performance of a traditional sentiment analysis workflow, which had a lot of steps where you have to clean the text, you have to do lemmatization, stemming, and start counting the incidence of this particular word with respect to negative or positive sentiments. It's a pretty long workflow, and you have to keep retraining it. Uh, and as opposed to just asking one question, is this negative or positive? And then they even included examples that were not in English, you know, Taglish, Filipino, Cebuano, uh, and the model picked it up. It probably won't be 100% perfect, but as a stepping stone for a more elaborate sentiment analysis uh, program, why not? So anyway, that's pretty much uh, all I wanted to share about SBCC. As I said, it's tip of the iceberg. The whole idea is the generative AI as a practice takes SBCC to a whole different level. And uh, although it began in the in the nonprofit space, I think SBCC has applications in the commercial space as well. If we want to think of a person's buying decision as a combination of many, many other factors, not just a function of frequency and reach, then SBCC becomes a powerful tool. Okay, so again, uh, this is my customary invitation. If you want a copy of the slides and maybe to send some feedback, you can send me your feedback at bit.ly slash AI for Lunch SBCC. This is case sensitive. And uh, again, I want to invite everyone uh, to follow me on my social media. I've started posting short videos on uh, TikTok and Instagram and, and YouTube shorts as well. These are cut videos from kind of the longer webinars I've been doing just as a way of making the content more consumable by everyone. Um, I also have a, a standing offer to any institution or group or, or school if you need a one-hour briefing completely free about AI, its implications, on what to do. I'm more than happy to oblige. You can reach reach out to me via socials or via support at serialytics.com. Uh, of course, goes without uh, saying all of these webinars are uploaded on my YouTube channel. I now have this is now my 10th webinar. So, you know, time flies, episode nine, but actually num uh, webinar number 10. And as I mentioned, we're now moving away from like general topics about AI into more specific topics, like how do you use AI for social behavior change? And then soon I'll probably tackle some of the more commercial use cases, like what about HR? What about operations? What about marketing? What about finance? Uh, because I'm sure people are curious about it. And ah, uh, yes. We've already uh, soft launched a series of capacity building programs. Uh, you can go to serolytics.ai for these. So we we're we're running a three day innovation camp. I'm I was in the middle of it last week and a couple of camps a few months ago. This is like an intensive three day uh, workshop where you get to combine design thinking and artificial intelligence. This is perfect for companies who are looking for new strategies to employ AI or people who want to understand the innovation process and how they can just use AI to plug into it. At the same time, uh, we're launching a, a one-day face-to-face course. We have actually done a few of these already. Uh, and the idea is to combine strategic planning uh, with AI. So it's kind of a more condensed version of the three-day workshop, but focusing on the prompts. And uh, I will be doing three-hour online uh, Zoom-based uh, Prompt Engineering Basic Boot Camps. So all of the schedules are posted on serialytics.ai. If you're interested, please hit us up. Okay, I think that's pretty much it. Let me check uh, the Facebook page if we have any questions. Looks like we don't. Uh, I got uh, a few questions on the on the registration. I think I'll I'll share the I'll share at least one of them. Uh, and this is about. Social media. So it says here, AI is already misused to further enforce social media. I guess that means echo, echo chambers. So interested in what can be done with AI to combat this. So I think this is important to, to recognize uh, echo chambers as a behavioral issue. And depending on what you want to do, you can apply SBCC accordingly. 
like do you want to encourage or encourage people to go offline for you know uh, days at a time uh, take go on a social media diet then let's educate people about it why would you want to do it what are the risks if you don't do it what are the facilitating fa facilitating factors what are the barriers to behavior and then craft campaigns that encourage uh, kind of going on a, a social media detox or we could look at the actual issue of echo chambers itself, which is really more algorithms encouraging similar content uh, be, to be consumed by you, you know. And in some cases, you can mitigate it, like on uh, the, uh, Twitter or whatever was formerly known as Twitter. You can change the trends setting from trends for you to Philippines trends or whatever country, and it comes up with a more unbiased feed of trends. Uh, but that's all just on Twitter, right? On other platforms, they may not allow you to do so. But the, the whole point here is any social issue uh, can be converted into a series of strategic messages. And uh, I guess it's just a matter of A-B testing to see if you can move the needle in that kind of a behavior. So yeah, thanks for that question. Okay, so that's it. Uh, we started early. I think we're ending on time. Uh, at the same time, please look forward to, to more webinars about other topics. So the idea now is how do you we use AI for specific things. At the same time, I've uh, been convening a series of meetups. So there's a new meetup. Uh, let, me give, uh, let me announce that. If you go to meetup.com and you can look for uh, practical AI meetups, so let me uh maybe like maybe let me go there for a moment and share that. So it's a very, very new meetup group. We call it practical AI meetups. And the whole idea here is we want to encourage uh, we want to bring meetups back. So meetups died during the pandemic and everyone moved online. We'll also do online meetups for sure. But this one, uh, I wanted to start with a face-to-face -face one. So our next meetup will be, our first meetup will actually be on August 10 in Makati, if you happen to be in the area. But I would want to go all over the place. So probably other parts of NCR and then later get into Region 4, Region 3, maybe as far as Bicol, and then eventually start flying to the Visayas in Mindanao. So the idea here is how do you get you know, more discourse? Uh, of course, online is okay, but I find that uh, like I was in Cebu about a week ago to talk to the Contact Center Association and the interactions I had there were fantastic in terms of uh, spreading AI to the Contact Center uh, industry. So I want to recreate that that uh, that meetup buzz. But yeah, because of the pandemic, I think we've been changed forever. So I think uh, certainly a good chunk of those meetups will also be online. But yeah, please uh, join us at meetup.com. Just look for practical AI meetups. And I will also announce this on my Facebook uh, channel as well. So with that, uh, thank you very much. That was episode uh, nine. And hope to catch you in another episode of AI for Lunch. Bye for now and have a good weekend.